Thank you, Eva. That's great. Okay, so it is with great honor that I get to work now with Lara Baxley, our new Academic Senate President. <laughs> which one's me? Which one, I know. Guess which one is which. It's going to switch throughout the day which one is which. So, okay. So, um, following just like what Eva told you, we have this incredible integrated planning manual. And on pages 34 and 35 of that, of the 2013 manual, uh, it told us that we need to assess our planning and decision making processes. Now, this is the second time we have assessed. Uh, the integrated planning manual. And this is the first time we assess the governance decision-making handbook. And uh, we, uh, from that and from the committee structure that it went through and everything, there were recommendations and finally there were president's recommendations. And now we implemented those, some of those recommendations and we get here. All right, so um, there were not um, any huge substantive changes. Um, mostly it was cleaning things up. Um, the timeline and um, the strategic plan, um, planning was streamlined. And uh, then, of course, the new ACCJC 2014 standards were incorporated into that, into the integrated planning manual. And as far as the um, decision-making handbook, um, the Board policies and administrative procedures were updated so that the correct numbers were in there as things had changed, um, new things got, had to get put in there, and also the ACGC, ACCJC 2014 standards were put in there. And the um, committee initiative forms were removed from the planning manual itself. They're just going to be on the website. So when you go to the website and you go to the integrated planning manual portion of the website, there will be a link there for your committee forms. The governance, sorry. It's your turn. <laughs> uh, okay, it's on the governance, but both of these uh, documents are loaded onto the accreditation website under integrated planning manual. You'll find the new one, and on the uh, governance link, you'll find the new governance with the links, the other links. Okay. All right, so uh, a lot of times I think there's such a lack of communication between us, and we start talking and we get in committees and then People get upset because they don't hear what's going on. And what better way to talk about what's going on in the state uh, in front of all of you today so there isn't any misconceptions or miscommunications. So we're going to talk about new statewide initiatives and new regulatory uh, requirements. And the first one that we've already uh, put into place was Assembly Bill 288. And this is the uh, dual enrollment. And the law, what they're looking at is to reach a broader range of students. So no longer are you taking those elite students or those high performing students. They feel all students should have access to college level courses. And then the next one is, and you heard about it with Sabrina who's done a fabulous job, the pathways. This is a huge in initiative throughout the state of creating pathways for high school students to get that first course under their belt and be the third course in their series and usually it's in that career technical education. But the other uh, portion of it is to prepare students to be college level ready, and that is in English and math. And so we're a little behind the times. This has been happening throughout the state, and we really just initiated a program in dual enrollment in fall 14. So in fall 14, we piloted with Lucia Marr, and they were great to work with, and we put in just the one course, Get Focused, Stay, Stay Focused, which is our curriculum that has been approved through our curriculum process, but it is really nationally known curriculum. And there is research that supports students that take this course, have a better pathway of finishing high school and moving on to college, either in career or transferring on to a four-year institution. So that is the PEDS course. Um, in fall 2015, we have expanded. We're working with all the districts. We have 11 high schools that we're working with. Uh, we have 74 sections of the Get Focused, Stay Focused. And then we have 18 sections of a career technical education 
and we're also working with three sex of, sections of general education. So that's pretty amazing how in one year and how many high schools we touch in that relationship building. And I cannot thank Sabrina is amazing working with uh, the high school principals. Unbelievable the work that she does. So thank you, Sabrina. Okay, the um, online education initiative. Um, so there are uh, 24 um, colleges that are going to pilot this um, uh, this fall, um, and they use Canvas, the, um, which is a, co a course management system that's common to all of them. Um, also, there's a tutoring platform to connect the local tutors to students online, and that's now available to all colleges. And um, online student readiness modules are integrated into Canvas, the um, course management system, and that's also available to the California Community Colleges. And our um, Cuesta's Distance Education Committee is going to evaluate that this semester, okay? All right. And so some things about the online uh, education initiative. Um, there is a new, this is a professional development opportunity for those of you who teach online or would like to teach online. There is a new online teaching and learning course for faculty um, offered through At One. And so that's supposed to be released this month. And so um, be looking for that. And um, this is a really exciting thing. There's an online course exchange that um, some colleges are piloting um, beginning in fall of 2016. And what this is allows is for students at one campus to be able to take classes online through another campus very easily, very seamlessly. Uh, we're not one of those pilot schools, but hopefully we can get involved in that as soon as possible. Okay. And the next thing here is um, Senate Bill 1391. It says Hancock. That has nothing to do with Ann Allen Hancock College. Okay, that, that is Lonnie Hancock, a state senator. And so she authored this bill. Um, and so this has to do with uh, teaching community college courses in a prison. We just happen to have a prison about two and a half miles away from us and uh, the California men's colony. And so we are currently working with them to develop an MOU uh, to teach some courses there. And currently the courses that we're working on are addiction studies and customer service academy. Okay, so you can be looking up for that. That's a really exciting thing to be able to make changes in the lives of the prisoners and it also helps us as well. Okay. So, and on that Senate bill also, uh, what they're looking at is, and all the research supports this, um, is they're looking for degrees and certificates to offer to the prisoners so they come out, the, the more educated they are, the less chance that they have of going back to a life of crime. And probably one of the best uh, advocates for this was our speaker at the Scholarship Awards Banquet, 54-year-old man. He was phenomenal just starting out and having an academic career. He'd been in, in uh, prison for about 24 years was not high school educated, and it was phenomenal to see his progress in a very short period of time once he was released. <laughs> student equity plan. So as you know, in the student equity plan and in the governance process and academic senate, we submitted a student equity plan. And, and that was in January of uh, 2015, and during March, the Chancellor's Office pulled together a group of faculty, students, administrators, and et cetera, and they reviewed the plans. Well, we have, we are not meeting some of the criteria, and we have to revise our plan, but also um, they added, with SB 860, they added new requirements. And it is a short time period, it's coming, uh, we have to resubmit it in late fall, and leading this process is our new Director of Student Equity and Success, uh, where she is, oh, Nicole Albertson, and she's going to be working with a, a Student Success Committee to get it in line, and then it'll go through the governance process again. But look for it in the early fall to move through that governance process. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> Try not to look at the funny face as a... That funny face. I already have a funny face. All right. 
Okay, so institutional set standards. Um, so let's look at this standard here, the ACCJC standard here. Um, I know there's a lot of words on there, but if you start at the upper left there, um, inst the institution establishes institution set standards, right? Okay, so these are standards for uh, completion rates and whatnot. And notice the asterisks there. Okay, so let's look over on the right at what that asterisk means. We're not going to read the whole entire thing, don't worry. Um, glossary. Okay, institution set standards, uh, performance metrics and measures set by institutions for student achievement in both individual programs and for institutional wide student achievement. Okay, so what this means is that our programs are going to have to set these, ins these set standards for their students for the standards of how many students are going to complete our courses and whatnot. Don't worry, you don't, you're not on your own here. Okay, so Academic Affairs and the uh, Institutional Effectiveness Committee will be working on helping with these uh, uh, set standards for the programs. Okay? Do I have one more? No, okay. I'm done. Oh, to you now. Okay. So... Um, you know, we already uh, set the standards, the institutional set standards, uh, a couple years ago. And we have to, last year we did not, uh, every year we do an annual report to ACCJC, and they ask us, have we set program standards? And we say, no, we have not. Uh, but it, we need to start getting on the ball and doing that. It's just another one of the many requirements that we have. Okay. So the good news, and it was really nice uh, uh, kind of a step with even what she talked about, our past history. And as you all recall, in the beginning of February, we announced that we were reaffirmed. Yay. Whoa. Yeah. So. Unbelievable. So, and I'm not going to read all this, but in our re reaffirmation, there is always a but, as you recall, in accreditation. We have a recommendation, and I'm not going to read this recommendation to you. You can read it yourself on this slide, but in, um, we have to submit a follow-up report in, uh, by October 2016. So as you recall, and if some of you that haven't you know, gone through this process before, it takes a long time to have a follow-up report go through the governance process. First of all, pull it all together, get the evidence, and uh, write it, go it through the governance process. This report has to be submitted and approved by the board in September 16. Now, when we were sitting in front of the commission, and it was uh, Trustee Mullen, Dr. Stork, and myself in front of the commissioners in January, they asked us specifically, you guys are awesome, but can you sustain it? And then they said, should we make you do a follow-up report, respond to your recommendation immediately, like as we always had to immediately, which would have been this fall? And we said, no, we can sustain it. We are good. We are awesome. We are unbelievable. We are a model college. We follow the standards at all times. I think we did a little BS there. I did a little BS because this time, it was probably the first time they asked me about 15 questions. All the commissioners sitting in high luxury chairs, you're sitting on a little chair, low. Anyway, but, uh, and I noticed Dr. Stork just kind of handed the questions over to me, which was <laughs> like, hey, what the heck? But um, anyway, we have had a year. We have had a year, and we have done very, very little to meet the recommendation. And so I had, and this is, and it's really uh, frustrating because everybody says it's Deb's problem. This is not Deb's problem. I am the ALO, the li liaison officer, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those duties later. But it is our problem, our problem. Because if we don't meet the recommendation, we will immediately go back to sanction. I don't know how more clear I can be and again, I am just the bearer of the news and help guide us through this process. So I want you to all be aware of it. We have done nothing to implement. So in, we have to Im implement by spring something, and we have to gather evidence. And at the same time, we have to write to the recommendation, and we have to write to all these standards. So I just want you aware of it, and there's going to be a lot of push and it is, and we have to change. 
But we've changed before. We're going to continue to change, and we need to embrace change. So there's my little lecture. Sorry. So at the same time, as you recall, they gave us four other institutional effectiveness recommendations. And uh, the recommendation two was learning outcomes assessment, timelines and assessment, results readily available, and program level outcomes in the catalog. We've already put in this academic year program level outcomes in the catalog. Check. Uh, but we are, with a student equity dollars, because it's tied to student equity, we purchased eLumen. And you're going to hear later today, and this affects the whole college, because we all do outcomes and assessment, we need to centralize our outcomes and assessments, and we need to pull the data on those individual students. The way we're getting funded today is very, very different than the way we've been funded before. And if you see the amount of dollars that uh, the student success dollars get, the student equity dollars, they're doubling our dollars this next year in student equity. And for some of you faculty that participated in that retreat, that two-day retreat we had in Avla, beautiful two days there, that was funded by student equity, professional development. So we need to centralize, and we're really trying to do that, and we really need to push so when we do the midterm report in 2017, we can show the evidence that we have centralized and we fulfilled this recommendation of institutional effectiveness. The third recommendation is implement a tracking process for student authentication. We're working on that. We need to do it a little bit stronger than what we have. Number four, consistent monitoring of records in employment, equity, and diversity. And I know HR is on top of that. And they, each one of these recommendations will be reporting to the steering, Accreditation Steering Committee over this next year. And recommendation five, of course, is board policies. And my expectation is the board will make sure policies are going through there regularly, evaluate, revise, and renumber. And we need to stay on top of that and move it through our governance process. And then we also have six actionable improvement plans that are identified in evaluation. Thank God, because last time we had 80-something in the last time we wrote a, uh, a self-evaluation. Do you remember following those for how many years and how much work was related to that? But we only have six, and uh, the team thought that was great. OK, as the ALO. So, it, it, it is a, a kind of a, a difficult position to be in as an ALO. And you know, I talk from my heart. I just talk real. You, the majority of you know me. I, I think I'm semi-approachable. Hopefully you think I'm approachable. But um, I pull the board pol uh, not the board policy, the policy, ACCJC's policy uh, for an accredi accreditation liaison officer and the role of an ALO. And of the many duties, one of, the, one of it is to promote an understanding of accreditation requirements, quality assurance. And the new standards in 1B alone, they mention quality nine times, nine times in one standard. And you have to remember, there is terminology, there's meaning behind words, and institutional effectiveness. And that's my role, is to communicate and have you an understanding of what that means. Um, again, I have to communicate information about accreditation and institutional quality that is available from ACCJC. I have shared with the Academic Senate President and the CCFT uh, training information that I have on mandates and requirements, and my expectation that they will, they will discuss that with their constituent groups. And then uh, I need to maintain regular communication with the CEO and the college on accreditation matters at all times. So those are just some of the roles that I have. So my expectation in beginning fall immediately, I am going to work with the Academic Senate. I am going to work with the Curriculum Committee, who is a subcommittee of the Academic Senate. I am going to work with CCFT, and I am especially going to work with the Distance Education uh, Committee, the director, and the coordinators, because we have to meet this recommendation, the recommendation one. And again, we need to embrace change and move forward and not be stuck where we were at one time. So I'm looking for implementation that we can write about in spring 16. 
And then, other than that, that is not the way I want to end this lovely day because we are, I mean, think about all the fabulous things that we're doing. I, it is amazing what's happening in the classroom. It's amazing uh, with the dollars that we hit, ha, have coming in, the professional development opportunities that we have. It is incredible that we get to look at our past, currently where we are, and plan for our future. And planning for our future, it, it means that we need to describe what our needs are. We need another uh, lab for biology. We need better upgraded labs for biology. I mean, it goes across camp. I'm sorry, I saw Ron. I have speaking to Ron. You know, we need to, what is need? Well, math is getting a new building, but we don't call it the math building. We call it the instructional building. So, but we need to prepare in a document about our future. So the next time we go out for a bond, and believe me, we have to go out for a bond again, we are prepared and we know what we're going to do. So with that, it's a very exciting time. Have a wonderful semester. My door is always open. Most of the time I'm not in there in my office, but <laughs> my door is always open. I would love to come to any division department meetings if you want to discuss. If you have an issue, come see me. Talk to me. You know, I really, you know, come talk to me and tell me. And if you have a problem, I try to fix it because my whole life I've been a problem solver. So anyway, with that, have a wonderful semester, and uh, we'll see you around the block. Thank you very much, uh, Deb and Lara, and uh, Dr. Conrad had to leave, but um, you can tell by, I think, her presentation, um, the gift that we have. How did I get Eva? Well, I worked with Eva for about 20 years uh, when she was the president at Moore Park, and then she was also the executive vice president at Moore Park for a long time. And we met because we uh, were serving on the Western State Conference Athletic uh, Conference Board. Uh, but when we were, ran into crisis, you know, each of us has a go-to person when we need some advice, we need some resource. Well, for me, that was Rocky Young. Rocky Young was a former executive vice president uh, at Santa Monica City College, became the president at Pierce College, and then, and then uh, retired as the chancellor of the LA Community College District. Probably the most difficult and screwed up job in the world, you know, to be the, the chancellor of that district. But Rocky, Rocky and I shared uh, presidencies. I was the president of the state Chief Student Services Officers Organization. He was the president of the Chief Instructional Officers Organization the same year, back in, I think it was 90, 93, 94, something of that sort. But we became, a, we became colleagues at that point. But he's always been somebody that I can turn to as a great network of people. So when we were in crisis mode and we had gone show cause, I took out my, do you remember what a Rolodex was? I had a card in there, and I called Rocky, and I said, who do you recommend to help us in planning? And he didn't hesitate. He said, Eva Conrad. And I said, great, I know Eva. And, uh, and that was true. The email I sent her about coming back and helping us was, do you want to come and play at Quest again? And uh, she certainly did. So um, last November, uh, we had, had another landmark opportunity here in this county, and that was the passing of Measure L. Um, the first time, and I know many of you were feverishly working for that benefit, either putting out signs in neighborhoods, uh, working the phone banks, talking to your friends and neighbors. Um, it all worked. It all worked also because the public had regained its confidence in all of us, in all of you, of what we do and how we do it. By us being able to turn this college around from where we were back in 2010 and being able to climb out of the ditch in time for that, that item to be placed on the ballot uh, was 
was amazing. And I have to tell you, after seeing bond measure after bond measure after bond measure in this county put up by school districts be, being royally defeated, um, as optimistic as I was, I, I remember that cloud uh, of possibilities that could happen. And uh, I had my bags packed, because you know, if that failed, you know, I was going to be out of town, you know. <laughs> no. But, um, but no, I, I trusted. I trusted the, the consultants we were using. I trusted the surveys that, that, we, um, that we did in order to get the pulse of where we were with our uh, voting constituency. And I really, uh, I really uh, was amazed at the work of our campaign committee and their dedication and their commitment and their positive outlook about the, the future. We were so positive and confident that we could pull this off, that we started working a year ahead of time. We invested in the likelihood that we would pass this bond. And if we hadn't done that, we'd still be a year away from being able to do what's already done today. And I want to credit Terry Reese and his working with our architects and our consultants uh, to be able to pull that off because we are way out of front of everybody else in this county that passed bonds. As a matter of fact, they're going to be struggling to find the labor market to do their jobs because we have them employed. <laughs> you know. So to help us, uh, <laughs> so at this time, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Vice President Chris Green and our Director of Facilities and Operations, Terry Reese, to come forward and bring you up to date on where we are with, uh, with the implementation of the first issuance, uh, what's, what's happened uh, since May, uh, what's going to happen this fall, uh, and, uh, and the, th the activities that you're going to see, and also prepare for the disruptions that are going to happen in your life as we go through this process. And we'll also hear also an update on where we are with our drought and how we're responding to the drought. So, Ladies and gentlemen, our buddies here. Thank you. So we're going to start with a quick update on what we're doing to respond to the drought and the governor's mandate to reduce our water use. In April, the governor issued a mandate to uh, save 25% or reduce our water usage by 25%. And that's based on what we used in year 2013, which was 122 acre feet. So with the mandate, we have to use, or we can use no more than 91.9 acre feet of water. Now, unfortunately for us, we, uh, we pay for water rights. So we get an annual allocation of water. So if we don't use the full allocation, we still pay the full price. So there's no, uh, budget savings for this. It's just about saving water. Uh, this chart shows the last uh, four years what we used in water and then what the mandate is. You can see last year there was a, it was a 20 percent reduction that we did from the year before and the governor had issued a goal. It wasn't a mandate, it was just a goal that everybody saves 10 percent and we were able to save 20. The, uh, the good news is that the mandate is based on what we used in 2013, so it's not 25% of what we saved. So uh, if you look at the chart, we only have to save about seven acre feet to meet the mandate, but as you'll see later, we're going to go way beyond that. So what we're doing, in the North County campus, we installed a new air-cooled chiller uh, in May that reduces the load on the water-cooled chiller. And without getting too technical, the, the uh, water-cooled chiller uh, reduces heat through evaporation, which uses water, and uh, this one used a lot of water. I taught him that, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So on, on normal days, the water-cooled chiller won't be used at all. On the really hot days, it'll, be, it'll supplement the air-cooled chiller, but this uh, change alone saves over 25% of our water use at the North County. And the best part was it was paid for by Prop 39 Clean Energy Funds, so there was no cost to the district. 
Now, on this campus, we're reducing a lot of the lawns. So you'll see a lot of dead lawns out there. The ones that are reducing will have、uh, signs on them that says、uh, turf reduction for drought.、Um, we're going to be converting most of those into drought resistant landscaping. The remaining lawns are being stressed. That means they're not being watered as frequently as normally, so they'll look kind of half dead. <laughs> Uh, we're installing low flow toilets and urinals, over 100、uh, low flow toilets and urinals. And also in the restrooms, we'll have the metered faucets、uh, that they only run for a short period of time. And we're also monitoring the water usage weekly so that we can、uh, quickly identify any leaks. This is an example of a lawn that was removed last year and replaced with drought tolerant landscaping. So you'll see more of those around campus. This is another example of where the lawn was removed and wood chips were put in and some trees and、uh, a table. So this area is still、uh, usable. <laughs>、uh, we do have some challenges with the drought. The soil is drying up, and when the soil dry, dries, it shrinks. And it's a little hard to see in this picture, but the,、uh, the soil has separated away from the sprinkler. And so when the sprinkler turns on, it, it kind of vibrates, jerks, and it can break the pipes. Also, if somebody steps on it, it's more likely to break. Another challenge we've had、uh, four pipes break. It's also under the strain from the、uh, shrinking soil. This is an eight inch pipe that broke. And for an example of, of the challenge, an eight inch pipe, if it breaks in the evening and we find it first thing in the morning and shut it down, just overnight, it would leak between three and four acre feet of water. If a full eight inch, or eight inch pipe leaking like that. So, how have we done so far? This, this shows、uh, that since the April mandate, it has、uh, three years comparison to what we're doing this year. So, you can, and, and the green bar is what we're doing this year. You can see in April we were about average, but since then, that's when we really kicked in. In May was almost a third of what we normally use, and、um, both June and July were under 50% of what we normally use. So, yeah. So, we're projecting, unless we have some major pipe breakage, that we'll be able to end the year with about a four, four, between 40 and 50 percent overall savings in our water use.、Uh, next, Terry's going to go into the bond projects. To put acre,、uh, good morning. Uh, to put acre feet in perspective, last month we saved 2.67 million gallons of water. So, good night, Adam. So, I'm going to do $275 million in eight minutes. So, hold on.、Uh, what we're going to show you is the work of over 40 people in the last five months.、Um, it's a, a significant team of professionals, both in house and, and contracted, and、uh, got a lot of pretty pictures.、Um, matter of fact, I'm counting on the Pretty picture on the next slide so you don't see my typo. And that is, which, which one's the advanced? This one? See, I need a VP to do that. So. Okay. So, a little bit of history、um, on Measure L before we get into what we've been doing.、Uh, Measure L is a bond that we passed, as you know, in November. Um, the typo, obviously, is that we're not 2015 to 2024. It's actually 2015 to 2027. It's a 12 year period. Three issuances, or excuse me, four issuances in that period that are three years apart. And、um, even though they vary in dollar amount, they'll total $275 million. The concentration of the projects are in renovation and repair. You'll see, a, you'll see what appears to be a concentration in new construction because. What we have coming out of the box are two new buildings. Those two new buildings are、um, due to us having to remove our modular、uh, buildings off campus. So we consider that a renovation or a repair, not con new construction. So, yeah. First issuance, $75 million.、Um, the two new structures in that issuance is the instructional building on the San Luis Obispo campus, where it's Deb. The instructional building on the San Luis Obispo campus. Instructional. <laughs> okay. And, and the campus center、um, in the North County campus.、Uh, the, those two structures will completely replace the modulars that originally existed 
uh, house those programs. And then the critical repairs being roofs, uh, HVAC, and so on. Those are the repairs that Dr. Stork and uh, uh, the Bond team really pushed to the public that that is the reason for Measure L, not empire building, not new construction, renovation, or repair. Second issuance also has two buildings, and also those two buildings are to replace uh, the housing for, for programs that exist. The campus center on the San Luis Obispo campus, which uh, will house most of the uh, student services uh, that, that we currently have scattered around campus, and the early childhood center in the North County campus, which currently resides in a modular. And then again, uh, repairs, upgrades, and uh, 21, uh, 21st century uh, technology upgrades. The one thing that you will notice when we get into the third and fourth issuances is that the new construction starts to reduce. And what that means is the uh, renovation and repair starts to increase dramatically. In the third and fourth issuances, we have respectfully, I believe it's $40 million worth of re renovations in the third issuance and almost 50 in the fourth. So it, it's a lot of repair work. Timelines, uh, timeline slide to show you the, the most important thing to get from this slide is where we are right now in 2015 in the third quarter and the occupancy date for the two new buildings is this time two years from now. If you consider that we started this, actually started this project, received our funding in March of this year, um, that's pretty incredible, I think. And we've got a couple of cool slides to show what that means. Okay, educational code 17292, this is the driver of what's required us to remove the modul modulars on campus. We've heard over and over, why are we rushing? Why are we pushing this modular replacement? Why does it have to be today? Educational code states that as of September 30, 2015, we can no longer use our modular buildings for educational purposes. We will meet that deadline. How we're gonna meet that deadline is the, are the facilities that are coming online today. We've installed in the last four months 21 modular structures for a total of 23,000 square feet. Um, the majority of these structures are on the North County campus, and these structures completely replace the whole existing North County campus. What you're seeing are pictures of the actual uh, North County uh, modular farm that we have up there. Okay, the fun stuff. July 22nd, 20, uh, 2015, we took a trip to Oakland. Um, Nikki Ro Rocha and myself and our two architects from PMSM and delivered over 100 pounds of plans. Those are the plans for the uh, campus center and the uh, instructional building. So you see, we had two of those carts, not just one. Here you see uh, actual uh, pictures of the two sets of plans. Um, we're in the intake specialist's office and, and going over the plans with uh, the DSA representative. You have a total of, I believe, 458 sheets of plans. Um, we, com we completed that in 110 working days, which works to 4.16 sheets per day. Okay. Um, and I, I learned, it's Chris. <laughs> He checks my math. Um, another point to note, you know, doing stuff fast and doing it correct can be two different things. The intake specialist reviewed both sets of plans. It took hours. She didn't find one discrepancy in either set of plans to prevent it from going into intake. So good answer. So, North County Campus Center, this gives you um, an idea of where the North County Campus Center is going to sit. The picture isn't reflective of the new parking and the, the concrete and landscape work that's gonna be around the building, but it's, it's mainly meant to show you how it orientates to the existing campus. Uh, that building is about 44,000 square, square feet two-story. We'll show you a, a, couple, a couple pictures of what that looks like. It's very difficult to see. Uh, the first floor, um, yeah, you almost can't see it at all. The first floor has, <laughs> It has some, some kind of fun stuff. The, the, the bookstore, the cafeteria uh, has what appears to be a ladder on the left-hand side. That is actually a staircase. We, we don't want people using ladders in this building. The health center, um, the vet center, uh, a big assessment center. 
On the first floor, also, we have an arts classroom. And uh, that was through a lot of work with the program. Um, and it has an exterior painting courtyard. So if you wanted to, to paint or do arts in daylight, it has a courtyard specifically for that. Second floor, um, primarily student services. You have you know, admission records, uh, non-credit, community programs, uh, all your counseling services and, and such on the second floor. Point of note, the classrooms, there are three classrooms in this building, two on the first floor, uh, or, or two on the second floor, one on the first floor. All of those are 45 cap, 1,200 square foot classrooms. The district, as long as we have a choice, will not go back to 960 square foot, uh, 35 cap classrooms. Okay, the fun stuff. This is the actual picture of how the building will look when it is completed in two years from now. Uh, this is facing Buena Vista. There's a large front, uh, large glazing to the front that is glass to the ceiling. Um, I believe that's Dr. Stork's new car to the left over there. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and so a lot of, a lot of, um, it's a large presence meant to be so that when students come on campus, they know where they're going to go. This is the view from what would be the 2400 building. On your right side is where the cafeteria is. It it's, uh, has a shade structure and roll-up door, so on nice days, you'll have inside and outside seating. On, in the center, that courtyard area is the art courtyard. That wall will be slightly higher, so you won't be disrupted, but it does have good natural, natural lighting. This is the view if you'd be looking from, uh, from Dallins. So as you're driving by Dallins, that's how you'll see the building. Very noticeable. Um, and we'll have uh, access to the parking from, from both, both roads. There's the ladder. <laughs> That's a one-piece suspended staircase. It's, it's, it's pretty unique. Uh, there will actually be computer, uh, computer uh, access directly under that staircase, people sitting on that, under that first landing. Um, that ceiling, you can't really tell, but it's a wood slat uh, metal ceiling. It is representative of how that lobby is actually going to look. This is the, caf uh, the cafeteria. Again, it's got a um, roll-up doors, so that inside-outside seating, a look-through ceiling. Again, this is reflective of how that, this is what the room will look like. Bookstore on your left. Uh, the bookstore is as designed. We did a lot of work with Trudy and her team. The, you can't really see the wall finishes, but the wall finishes, the furnishing, the, the carols, is and the glazing is exactly as that room will look. On the right, what you're, what you're looking at is the second floor of the campus center looking from the back of the, the room towards the staircase. In the center, these are all computers to assist counseling, anybody else that needs students to do data entry while they're waiting to, to be seen by the student services needs. And it's directly across from the offices that they're going to be seen. So a student can come in hit reception, be assigned to a computer, do their input, and wait, wait to be called in. You'll also notice that it's hard to see, but in the center of that white area is a skylight. That skylight opens down to the first floor, so those that have offices on the first floor will actually have somewhat of natural lighting to their, to their first floor. This is the instructional building. <laughs> the instructional building uh, sandwiches between um, the 2100 building and the Early Childhood Education Building. It is a two-story, 32,000-square-foot building. The landscape is also reflective. It is what will be in there. Following our new policy of, of larger classrooms, we have uh, eight 45-cap classrooms and one 80-cap classroom. So it can double as a forum. Uh, th these, this, the, this structure and the North County Campus Center will be our leading buildings for AV technology. Second floor, I, I don't think anybody's interested in this, these items. Uh, 46 standard offices, <laughs> three double-sized offices, and three conference rooms. Deb Wolf was definite when she said, I need to have big conference rooms, they have to have lots of AV, we need to do accreditation, uh, which we haven't heard about at all today. Um, and so we do have significant conference rooms um, in the second floor, but primarily uh, faculty offices. There's a, there's a copy room, um, a kitchen lounge. Uh, the, the lounge is accessible from two directions. Uh, 
And you'll get a view of the interior walkways here in just a minute. Kind of, we can show you the coves that we've set aside for students that are waiting for their faculty. This is a view from the 2400 building. In the case of a hurricane, the best place to be is in that staircase because it is a rated staircase for hurricanes. We thought that was a nice touch. <laughs> no real other reason. Um, it actually does, the side effect of that is it does allow light from outside into the staircase so we can meet Title 24, which says that you have to have so much natural light. So the staircase will have no lighting during the daytime because it gets so much natural light from outside. That is, of course, the main reason. This view is from the 2300 building. It kind of gives you a scale uh, of, if you're from the 2300 building, it is a substantial structure. Uh, it will have a courtyard, the building will have a courtyard between the instructional building and the, the early childhood education building. Another view from ECE. For the AV concentrating folks in here, we are not going to put the screens in front of the whiteboards in, the, in this building, okay? <laughs> We, we did want to show, though, basic uh, finishes, the fact that the rooms will have windows, so you'll get some daylighting, and they, and they will be AV intensive. The 80 cap classroom, we hope to have the leading uh, AV technology period, that uh, multiple flat screens, multiple projectors. Um, so that's our plan on that. What you have on... On the right side is the walkway that faces the children's center on the second floor. It also is the corner, off, or the corner area of the largest conference room in the building. We have frosted glass that goes into the conference room that transfers natural lighting from outside through the hallway into the conference room. But you can still have a meeting in the conference room and no one will be able to see what your content is or who's in the room by the frosted glass. So, you know, it kind of gives us the ability to have the natural light and still not compromise your conference or in, you know, disrupt your conference. The other side is we're, tr we're trying to show the finishes and the coves that are on the areas opposite from the faculty offices so that students will have places to sit. There will actually be a couple places where students can plug in their, their um, personal devices to charge and that sort of stuff. We came back to this slide just purely to, to emphasize the uh, dollar amounts in Upgrades and renovations, uh, I think we touched on that well enough, but it is significant in the second half. Okay. This slide, it kind of gives me a point to state that of the $3 million worth of construction that we've done in the last four months, we've issued contracts to eight contractors, and 100% of that money was kept in San Luis County. We can't guarantee that we can, we can get all of the money funneled to local contractors. It, it, it has to do with delivery methods and large construction. But wherever possible, we'll shape packages in a manner that's legal to get them to our local contractors and, and keep our local people working. So anybody that saw the Measure L campaign saw our lovely roofs. The, one on, the picture on your left-hand side is the roof of the 4500 building. It was ready to go. The picture on the right side is the completed roof on the 1100 building, which the chain link fence comes down on today. Actually, it was supposed to come down this morning, so we'll see. Go one, one more. Then the famous exhaust fan. Uh, Dr. Stork was asked numerous times in Measure L, do we know where that exhaust fan is? We do. That exhaust fan is on the 1100 building. The picture on the right is the new exhaust fan that, we had, that we've replaced. This is a, another key slide, uh, one that um, Keith is from Computer Services is waiting to jump on. Uh, computer Services portion of Measure L is $16 million. That works out to about $1.3 again million dollars per year. Uh, $1.3 million is approximately the funding for Computer Services for the last six years. So they've got a lot of work to do. They have a lot of infrastructure. The, the bond team is stepping up as is Keith's team and a lot of work to do. But I believe in the end we'll have a great system. Okay, a little peek ahead. We have a couple slides here, just two, and uh, this is our rendition of what the Early Childhood Center would look like. 
We already have floor plans starting on this, and this is the start of the second issuance. And the second, or the, the second slide I have, which is my last slide, is reaching into the third issuance. So that's the Trades and Technology Center. It's a phenomenal building. We've already met multiple times with the programs, and it's, it's going to carry the needs of that program for the next 20 years. So we're looking forward to building that out and getting, getting to the third issuance. So that's it. Thank you very much. I call it the math building. <laughs> I want to thank uh, trustees George and Hitchman for joining us today, and I especially want to thank my friend uh, Dr. Marie Rosenwasser for joining us today, and again thanking her for the thoughtfulness of creating that leadership award, and, and I had the honor of renaming it in her honor uh, because of that. <clears throat> Today, we recognize those employees who are celebrating years of service milestones. Tomorrow, these employees begin their next period of service, seeking new opportunities that will successfully influence the educational journey of our students. Today, colleagues of April, Marie, Sabrina and Lisa confirm the excellence with which each carries out their responsibilities of their positions while enriching the lives of those with whom they work. Tomorrow, each of these outstanding employees will become role models for our next generation of employees, many of whom we met earlier this morning. Today, I have the privilege of recognizing Kevin for his tireless, and selfless leadership he has displayed over the last four years as we climbed out of the pit of accreditation crisis. Tomorrow, I have great expectations as Kevin joins the Accrediting Commission in January as a faculty representative that he, he will become an invaluable asset to that body as it continues to assist all community colleges in achieving compliance with the standards in improving their service to students. Today, we welcome 75 new tenure track faculty, adjunct faculty, classified staff, confidential staff, and management employees to the Cuesta family. Tomorrow, they will begin their journey toward providing excellent teaching and service while seeking ways that they can each create a legacy that will enrich the experience of future students and colleagues. Today, we see evidence of Measure L in action, evidence that we promised the voting public during our bond campaign. Tomorrow, we will continue to be true to our promise as we get approval from the Department of State Architect, start construction on two new buildings highlighted earlier, gain occupancy two years from now, and begin preparation for the second issuance of $70 million in 2018. Today, as outlined in our integrated planning manual, we launched the creation of our 2016 to 2026 Education and Facilities Master Plans that will guide us through the next decade of our history. Tomorrow, we will develop a new 2017 to 2020 strategic plan that will address the strategies that we will be utilized to achieve the institutional goals. We will revise and adjust our operational plans in a manner that directly supports the master plans. We will create a body of evidence that will help us evaluate the degree to which we were successful in meeting our goals. Today, we were able to provide a modest beginning to improve salary schedules for all employees. Tomorrow, we are committed to continue to identify ongoing resources that will help relieve the financial burden that individuals and families are experiencing today. 
We are committed to be financially prudent as we prepare for Proposition 30 to sunset. We are also committed to explore all avenues that will improve our enrollment, that which most directly impacts the rise and fall of our general fund revenue. Today we feel a sense of pride in what, in what we have, by working together, accomplished these past six years in achieving reaffirmation of our accreditation, developing and utilizing a master plan, a mission statement, strategic plan, operational plans, and our governance and decision-making handbook. We developed, implemented, assessed student learning outcomes, and made improvement decisions for each course that we offer. We launched 21 associate degrees for transfer, paving the way for hundreds of our students to successfully transition to the California State University. Tomorrow, we have to sustain what we have started, show evidence that the assessment of our processes and our outcomes influences the success of our students in achieving their stated goals. We have to embrace the current recommendation related to distance education and our non-compliance with faculty training and course equivalency between distance and face-to-face -face courses. We have to accept the fact that we don't do optional when it comes to compliance issues. Today, Cuesta College is one of several community colleges along the coastal corridor that is relatively small, rural in nature, has high housing costs, flat high school graduation rates, an increasing retirement population, and relatively low political influence in Sacramento. We share similarities in relation to enrollment challenges and funding issues. Tomorrow, the presidents of Cabrillo College, Gavilan College, Monterey Peninsula College, Hartnell College, Cuesta College, Allen Hancock College, and Santa Barbara City College have agreed to form a new alliance called the Central Coast Community College Collaborative. <laughs> called the 5C. Now, I wanted to be C to the fifth power, but they, uh, <laughs> they were not very understanding of my, my personal need. The purpose of C to the fifth power, <laughs> is to create a stronger voice when it comes to policy and funding initiatives that negatively affect colleges like ours. Today, I am beginning my 49th year of service to Cuesta College and my 52nd year in education. I am also beginning a new three-year contract extension to serve as your president. This will also be my last contract serving as your president. Now somebody said, right, yeah. <laughs> I could not be any more proud of the work that you have accomplished in the last six years. It is truly, in my estimation, phenomenal. Tomorrow, I will be helping to pre prepare this college for change. Change in leadership, but not change in direction, processes, or governance. You own that. You now have a planning and decision-making system in place that is not dependent on who sits in my office, or who the vice presidents are, or who the president of the academic senate is. I believe our integrated planning process is president-proof. We all have the opportunity to give input and suggest changes during the scheduled assessment intervals, but no one person or committee owns it. You collectively own it. But what comes with ownership comes accountability and responsibility. You have demonstrated to me that you are ready, that this college is ready to embrace change that will add to the successful system that is already in place today.
Today, I am excited for the beginning of a new academic year, the 52nd in Quest's history. Tomorrow, being Monday, I will be re-energized by the appearance of 8,500 students arriving on our various campus sites, full of anticipation of starting a new year, some fully confident, some scared to death, some prepared, some ill-equipped, but all knowing that we are here with open arms, ready to do our very best to help them achieve whatever goal that they have in mind. That is what we do. Thank you, and have a great semester. Thank you. Class dismissed early, yeah.